do it. We're going to do Rosh Hashanah today and Yom Kippur next time. So if you don't come to that second session, you'll never find out what happens in the end. Um, because I don't know what you guys know, I'm going to try and give you about uh, six or seven things from which I hope at least three will be things that you individually didn't know before. However, just to cover myself now that Ari has uh, offered my, my bank balance to you all, um, I'm going to make it three things that collectively at least one person didn't know, uh, rather than every individual, just to make it a little easier for me. But let's, uh, let's start out. Um, Rosh Hashanah, we're all familiar with Rosh Hashanah coming up in a week and a bit, two weeks. Um, well, where do we get it from? Uh, so in the Torah, there is no Rosh Hashanah, right? The Torah does not refer to Rosh Hashanah at all. I wonder if that's a new fact for one of you. Um, so there is no reference to Rosh Hashanah at all in the Torah anywhere. What the, Rosh Hashanah, what the Torah tells us is that on the first day of the seventh month, first day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy day, a, a gathering. It shall be a Yom Teruah, a day of blowing, and a Yom Azikaron, a day of remembrance. Okay, so that's what the Torah says. It should be a day of blowing and a day of remembrance. It is not called Rosh Hashanah, and any intelligent person would immediately say, well, if it's the first day of the seventh month, it can't possibly be the new year. Right? It's the seventh month. It's clearly not the new year. So uh, there we have it. That's uh, my first uh, offering. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is not from the Torah. Um, so when did it become Rosh Hashanah? Well, we don't know exactly, but we know that by the time we come to the Mishnah, which is about 2,000 years ago, Roman times, uh, the Mishnah certainly called it Rosh Hashanah. Um, the, uh, Rosh Hashanah, for the those of you who are not quite sure, is the head of the year or the beginning of the year is what it means literally, Rosh Hashanah. It's the same, of course, word Rosh as we use for the beginning of a month as well, Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month. So Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. Who decided this was the beginning of the year, especially given that it's the seventh month? We don't know. We don't know. What we do know is that the rabbis of the Talmud had a debate about when was the world created. Now, those of you who are regular uh, shul goers and liturgy readers and uh, enthusiasts for such things may well know that on Rosh Hashanah, we say, today was the day on which the world was created. Is it people familiar with that? Today is the birthday of the world. Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world, right? You all know that. Did you know that the Torah doesn't say anything about that? So how do we know it's the birthday of the world? I mean, nobody's got the newspapers from that uh, period. Uh, nobody's got any original photographs. Uh, it wasn't written down anywhere. The Torah doesn't say it was the birthday of the world. How can we dare to say today is the birthday of the world? Well, in the Talmud, there is a debate between the rabbis as to when was the world created? And roughly half of the rabbis said, well, it's obvious. And you all know it's obvious, isn't it? When would the world have been created? Clearly spring. I mean, isn't spring the time when everything starts, right? That's, that's obvious. The, the world must have been created at springtime, right? That, that's clear. And we all know when springtime is in the land of Israel, in the Middle East, it's Pesach time. So the month of Nisan, that month, the beginning of Pesach, the spring, the sap starts to rise, the world is created. That's clearly the time of the creation of the world. But the other rabbi said, no, 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 it's not then. It's Tishri. It's autumn time. Oh, what do you call it? Fall. Okay. It's the beginning of fall. That's when the world was created. Well, they debated backwards and forwards. How are you going to resolve this decision? When was the world created? Well, you know, the Sanhedrin was a democracy. They had a vote. And the majority voted for Tishri. And so Rosh Hashanah became the day on which the world was created. Now, some of you may feel, well, that's, that's not right. I mean, either the world was created on Rosh Hashanah or it wasn't. You can't have a vote. 
I mean, well, maybe you can nowadays in, in America, I don't know. But I mean, if, if you want to vote, are trees made of wood or not? I mean, it doesn't matter what the majority says. They are made of wood. That's all there is to it. And even if it's only a minority, you can't vote and go, well, from today, we're going to say trees are made of plastic or something. They're made of wood. But the Sanhedrin decided to vote and they made Rosh Hashanah the day of the creation of the world. Now, folks, I want you to stop and loosen your brains here and get into some real thinking. On what day was the world created? It's a stupid question. Right. Because when the world was created, there wasn't a day. When I say wasn't a day, of course, I mean, there wasn't a date. Right. We all know the story of creation. Right. It was evening and it was morning the first day and so on and so forth. But there was no date. It's idiotic to wonder whether it was the first of Tishri or the 10th of Nisan or the 25th of Cheshvan or any other date you want. It's an idiotic question. So the rabbis were not idiots. How could they discuss on what day was the world created? Well, I think two things were going on in their minds. They wanted to celebrate the creation of the world. I mean, why would you not? It's a fabulous thing to celebrate. They wanted to celebrate the creation of the world. Um, so when would be the best time to do it? And of course, as we've said already, some rabbis obviously went for the obvious option. You, you celebrate um, at springtime it's when things start but other rabbis suggested the fall what were they thinking when they suggested that i think the two things in their minds one is there's this odd day commanded in the torah and yet there appears to be no reason for it this first day of the seventh month you're supposed to have a special day you're supposed to remember you're supposed to blow Nobody tells you why or what or anything. It doesn't seem to be an anniversary of anything. It doesn't seem to connect to anything. And I think the rabbis, the rabbis are very economical with these things. They go, well, there's an empty day. Let's use that. So that's one possibility. The second possibility is, I think, much deeper and goes to something about the Jewish mind. You know, we always think that something starts on the upbeat. But actually, Jewish thinking recognizes that things start on the downbeat. You build up, you don't work down. So when does the Jewish day start? It starts in the evening. So when does the Jewish year start? It starts in the fall. When does the world start? It starts before growth can be seen. When does a baby come into being? Well, at conception, right? All kinds of things are being built in, are being pregnant in the world. And therefore, I think that those rabbis who voted for Tishri for Rosh Hashanah as the birthday of the world, were thinking in very deep, traditional Jewish ways. It starts on the downbeat. And we build up. So we don't start when things are at a crescendo, already going. We start, we build up. I don't know if you've noticed that the uh, days of the, of the week uh, in Hebrew, only one day of the week has a name. It's called Yom HaShabbat, right? All the other days don't have names. All the other days are just numbers. Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, the first day, the second day, and so on. The real name of these days, however, if you go to Israel, nobody will tell you this. If you go to Israel, you turn up on Sunday and they'll tell you it's Yom Rishon, first day, right? Monday, Yom Sheni, second day. But the real name is Yom Rishon Le Shabbat the first day to Shabbat, Yom Sheni Le Shabbat, the second day to Shabbat, Yom Shishi Le Shabbat, the sixth day to Shabbat, and then the next day is Shabbat. Now, that doesn't go according to the way that we are accustomed to in the Western world. When you want a spaceship to take off at a certain moment, what do you do? 
you say 10, 9, 8, 3, 2, 1, take off, right? You count down, don't you? Not Jews. Jews count up. How strange if we're counting towards Shabbat that we don't say six days to Shabbat, five days to Shabbat, two days to Shabbat, one day to Shabbat. It's Shabbat. We don't do that. We go the first day to watch Shabbat, the second day to watch. If we're building up. We're always building up, building up. There was a debate between the rabbis about Hanukkah. You may know the schools of rabbis of Hillel and Shammai. It's two different schools of rabbis. Shammai said that what we need to do with the uh, candles of Hanukkah is we need to count them down. No, he's being very logical about this. You start with eight. That's when you've got your full pot of oil, isn't it? And then you count down. Yeah, you, you start with eight, and then you've got seven, then you've got six, then you've got, and the last day you've got just one because it's the end of the miracle. It's all finally finished. You've got to the end of it. Hillel says, no, 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 don't do that. Count up. Start with one, go on to two, go on to three, right? So that by the end, you've got the whole thing blazing. It's full. Another piece of counting that we do, guys, some of you will be familiar with the counting from Pesach to Shavuot, from Passover to Pentecost. All right, we count these seven weeks, 49 days. How do we count them? The first day, the second day. How strange. We're counting towards something. I mean, how many shopping days to Christmas? You know, you, know, you say there's 33 shopping days to Christmas. Every day is a shopping day now. But you say so it's so many days, you know, you count down. Not amongst the Jews, we count up. So to start the year at autumn time is a very Jewish thing to do. By the way, uh, all your colleges and schools do the same thing. That uh, Jewish New Year has influenced the pattern of academia throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Southern Hemisphere, schools start in January. But throughout the Northern Hemisphere, um, schools and colleges start in September, October. It's the Jewish pattern. Uh, and, and we did that to the world. Well, we made the seven day week as well. So we gave that to the world as well. Um, so that's why I think the rabbis suggested that Tishri Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world. I hope that's a new thought for some of you. Why do we say it's the birthday of the world? Um, and the rabbis, of course, are smarter than most of us. I, I think I remember when I came uh, a scholar in residence all those years ago, I did a talk maybe about calendars. It's one of my great enthusiasms. Um, and I asked the question, it's a, I can ask you the question now. It is the 7th of September, right? 7th of September today. What happened on this very day 10 years ago? Now, you will all start trying to think, hmm, okay, well, what's uh, 7th of September, 2010? Mm, I don't, could it have been? I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, maybe, right? And of course, the answer is nothing. Because this very day didn't happen 10 years ago. This very day is happening today. It is just a human convention that we have chosen to call one day every year the 7th of September. Anniversaries are a human construct. It is stupid to ask on what day was the world created. It's a human construct. You all know that the Jewish calendar, people say, moves about. But it doesn't. The first of Tishri is always on the first of Tishri. It's September which moves about. Who made that crazy system? Right? So anniversaries are for the benefit of human beings to think about stuff. You want to think about getting older? Have a birthday. Right? On what day do you want to have your birthday? When it suits you. Uh, you, we talked about the Queen right at the beginning. She has her birthday on the day she was born, and then she's got an official birthday because she was born in the winter. It's not very nice, you can't have parades. So you have um, an official birthday in the springtime where you can have uh, soldiers marching up and down and stuff, right? 
You do it in order to celebrate. So that's Rosh Hashanah, uh, the birthday of the world. Now, um, it's a day of blowing. What are we supposed to blow? Why are we supposed to blow? Doesn't tell us. Nowhere in the Torah are we told what to blow or why to blow. Well, we, you all know the tradition and the halakha. If you want to get into the halakha, we blow the shofar. Right? And we blow it according to a certain number of notes and so on and so forth. There's a tradition of how we do it. But the Torah doesn't uh, tell us why. And so, of course, uh, we flood in with our thinking as to why do we blow the shofar. And I suspect that if any of you have stopped to think about that or have learnt about it or whatever, you will have been told the classic Maimonidean answer. Rabbi Maimonides from the 12th century proposes, we blow the shofar in order to act like a kind of uh, alarm clock, an alert to us um, to, uh, to wake us up and make us repent and uh, concentrate on our thoughts. Right. Um, well, it's a it's a nice idea. It could be that. In the Machsor, in the uh, Rosh Hashanah service, um, and I must say here at this point and declare my uh, my uh, prejudices, my limitations. I come from the Orthodox community, and so my knowledge is of the Orthodox liturgy. So those of you who come from other kinds of communities, forgive me if I talk about the Orthodox liturgy and I don't know how it works in reform communities or whatever. OK, so this may not be exactly the same, but certainly in the Orthodox liturgy on the Rosh Hashanah day, we have an extensive part of the service that talks about what is called the shofarot, the, the, the business of blowing the shofar. And there are lots of quotations from the Tanakh, from the Bible, about the shofar being blown and so on and so forth, and lots of discussion about why we blow the shofar and all the rest of it. And you would think that if we wanted to know why the shofar was blown, we would look in this collection of all the thoughts that anybody could come up with, all the quotations about blowing the shofar, you have a look in that. Right? And what do we find? we find that it is clear as to why we are blowing the shofar. And why are we blowing the shofar? To wake God up. To get God to pay attention. It's not what Maimonides says. Maimonides says we blow the shofar in order to get us to pay attention. But according to the traditional liturgy, we say we blow the shofar in order to get God to pay attention. That's strange, isn't it? I hope that's a new idea for you. Because Jews are tremendously chutzpahdic with God, as I think you know. I mean, some of our greatest moments uh, in the Tanakh are when people argue with God. I mean, that's the pinnacle, really, when Abraham argues with God at Sodom and Gomorrah, or Moshe argues with God when God says he's going to destroy the, the, uh, the recent slavers escaped from Egypt. All right, they argue with God. That's an absolute... Uh, towering moment and you can see God almost bringing it on it's almost an educational moment God is is seeking to get them to think this through um, and here we have a practice to demand a relationship with God to to assert to assault the heavens with this sound uh, to get God to pay attention to us what chutzpah isn't that wonderful Right. That chutzpah, by the way, is also expressed in the uh, common and I think very popular uh, prayer, Avinu Malkenu. Right. Avinu Malkenu means our father, our king. Now, you'll be aware that Rosh Hashanah uh, and Yom Kippur are called the Yamin Norayim, the days of awe. Now, I, I want to stress here that the word awe has a meaning, uh, and it's not the contemporary American one, which is generally means, yeah, yeah, 
right? Oh, awesome. I mean, I don't know what's happened to the word awesome, but it's collapsed entirely into meaning virtually nothing whatsoever. But awesome is in fact awesome as a word, right? And uh, until everybody took to using it as a way of avoiding thinking of any other words, it was highly reserved for truly serious, unimaginable moments of awe, right? Um, and these days of awe are days of monumental grandeur. We stand nose to nose with God. And when we meet God, what do we say to him? Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king. Now notice this, okay, you in America, you don't have a king. You are blessed with the wonderful uh, institution of president, which of course gives so much more grandeur and status and clarity to the nation than our dull, old, boring, old, incompetent queen. You know, uh, if only we could have people like you get to lead the nation, you know, we'd be in so much better a place. So um, you perhaps don't understand about kings. We do, right? Kings are supposed to be grand things. I mean, you know, they march about with crowns on and ermine and, and retinues and golden couches and things like that, right? Um, and so we know God is king. Well, you know, I say we know God is king, but this is rather interesting. Again, I come back to the Orthodox liturgy and it may be different. I don't think it is, but it may be different in other traditions within the Jewish world. Those of us who are kind of rather um, OCD doveners, you know, who have to be dovening all the time, doing prayers and stuff, strapping on the leather um, and doing all that business. Um, it is very, very easy to get into a mindless routine, really, just keep saying the same old, same old, um, uh, and all of that stuff. Sorry, just before I say that, I've just noticed um, uh, J. Cynthia Weber said, school start in the fall in the Northern Hemisphere because the kids are done with harvest. Well, you know, I, I just, I'm not sure about that because I think the harvest comes in after school starts certainly does here in the UK. Um, the harvest uh, gets collected sometime nearer to the end of September, beginning of October. I don't know how it is in the States, but I wouldn't be surprised if in northern states anyway, the harvest doesn't come in until much later. Um, but be that as it may. Uh, and, and somebody else has mentioned we have a harvest festival at this time of year, so it'd be a good time to celebrate the new year. But of course, we've got a harvest festival. It's called Sukkot. Right, we don't need Rosh Hashanah for that, um, which of course is three weeks later. So that also says something about time of year. Um, anyway, in the davening, if you if you daven every day, as you can well imagine, and it's the same words uh, uh, and so on, you can well imagine it becomes very easy for it to become rote. And you stand in a room and you go blah, 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 and you say it all and it's all done. And by the end of the session, you can't quite remember whether you said it all or whether you didn't. But you're just doing it, right? Just going on with it. This is slightly resisted by the fact that during the course of the year, there are ever such tiny tweaks in the text. So suddenly when you move from summer into winter, you change two words in the middle of the Amida. And I can tell you now, it throws you out for weeks because you're so used to blah, 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 and suddenly there's two words you have to change. By the time you got used to changing them, six months later, you've got to change them back to the other two words. There's those kinds of little tiny, tiny tweaks in the, in the conventional services. During these 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there's another series of tweaks of tiny changes in the conventional text. And it's really quite surprising. In several places where we refer to God as God, during these 10 days, we change the text and stop calling God 
God and we call him King. Now, by the way, for those of you who are worried about the gender specifics of King and so on, I'm really not uh, trying to impose that. And I, although I use the word him, uh, frankly, I'm uh, not gender bound in my understanding of God, but I use those words for convenience's sake. Um, so what a strange thing to do. These days of awe, Sure, I mean, surely God is more awesome than a king? I mean, what's the higher status? What's, what's, the, what's the top position, king or God? Why would we, on the days of awe, choose to call God a king? Why would we not intensify those places where we call him a king to change it into God in order to kind of upgrade it on these days of all? Yet we don't do that. And so in this central prayer, as we started with our Vino Malkeno, our father, our king, we use the word king. And that seems to be a downgrading of God. Well, folks, what do we know about gods and what do we know about kings? Right? God is all-powerful. God defines morality. God can do whatever he likes. He is in complete control if he so chooses to use it that way. What do we know about a king? Well, a Jewish king, this is important to remember, a Jewish king is bound by the law. A Jewish king is not the definer of the law. A Jewish king is the defender of the law. You know, there's lots of um, stuff in the Torah about how when the Israelites have a king, he will have to carry around the Torah with him, have to write his own Sefer Torah, right? He's bound by the law. The king is bound by the law. That idea of a constitutional monarch uh, didn't enter into the world's thinking until around two or three hundred years ago. Uh, but the Jews had it, that a king is bound by the law. Still in Britain, um, you heard that I'm a magistrate, uh, when um, people uh, come into the court, uh, behind my head on the back of the courtroom uh, is the crest of the queen, right? And people, when they come in and when they go out, they bow. And, you know, I used to think they were bowing at me, but actually they're not. They're bowing at the crest behind me because this is the queen's court and every case every criminal case is r versus whoever the defendant is who's r r is regina the queen and if it wasn't a queen it was king it would be rex so all criminal cases in britain are r versus whoever because it's the queen's law the queen is the definer of the law in this system but in Jewish law, it's God's law. So when we call God a king, we are making God subject to the law. I mean, is that chutzpahdik or is that chutzpahdik? We're telling God on this day, you have to abide by the rules. And not only that, as if that's not bad enough, as if we're not demoting God from God to king, we preface it with Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king. not even our king, our father, our father, our king. We nominate ourselves as members of the royal family and we wheedle our way up to God. We sidle up to him and say, not only do you have to follow the rules, we're family. Be nice. It's a beautiful chutzpah. When you're there, wherever you'll be, in shul, out of shul, on Zoom, I don't know what you'll be doing. If you're singing along, guys, feel it. Feel how remarkable that Avinu Malkeinu is. So I mentioned before that in the Rosh Hashanah service, as I say, the one I know anyway, there is a section 
called the shofarot, the stuff that goes on and on about the shofar, where it tells us that you blow the shofar in order to get God to pay attention, to remember, right? You blow the shofar to get him to remember how great Abraham was and to remember what he promised and to remember uh, Isaac and Jacob and to remember the giving of the Torah. You know, that's why we blow the shofar, says the liturgy. And we have another whole section of malchiyut, going on about kingship and what kings are about and what kings are supposed to do again telling God how he's supposed to behave and the third section is zikronot remembrances now this word zikron uh, you'll be uh, familiar with it I'm sure yizkor uh, zikron livracha is a common thing to say when somebody passes away may their memory be for a blessing right that that word zecher uh, remember um that word is in the name of this festival in the torah yom hazikaron a day of memorial and that would be great wouldn't it uh, there's only one problem it doesn't tell you what you're supposed to be remembering. It's a day of memorial, and yet you perfectly reasonably would say, okay, I'm ready for it. What should I remember? Silence. It doesn't tell you. A day of memorial. Well, one part of the answer uh, was constructed by the rabbis when they said well it's the creation of the world remember the creation of the world by the way there's a little bit of dispute about whether it's the creation of the world or creation of man whether it was the sixth day or the first day it's a detail really um but uh, so there there are some people who will tell you rosh Hashanah commemorates the creation of adam and others who will say it create uh, the creation of the world and some who will say well it commemorates the whole sequence of creation um, but so the, the rabbi suggested that's what we should remember but what else could Yom HaZikaron a day of remembrance require us to do well it, it could be just reminding us of how to behave we should remember proper behavior we should remember uh, you know God's instructions to us or something like that but that's not talked about that's just not there so when again we look at the liturgy, and we look at the text, and we look at the prayers, and we see this huge chunk about remembrance, what is it about? Again, it's about God remembering us. This Yom Azikaron, according to the liturgy, is us saying to God, can you remember that we've got a relationship. Do you remember how good we were? Do you remember what we did? Have you, do you remember the loyalty we've shown? Do you remember the great people who fought on your behalf? God, you better care for the Jewish people because we are your guys. What a remarkable, astonishing thing to do on this Rosh Hashanah. Well, folks, um, those are the three central features the shofar, the remembrance, those are both in the Torah, Yom Teruah and Yom Hazikaron, and uh, the Malchiyot, that's built into the liturgy, the creation of this king theme. And yet all of them is not a, a, are not as you'd expect. So I hope somewhere there there's three things. But let's try this one. Apple and honey. That's universal, isn't it? No, it's not. Um, only Ashkenazim do apple and honey, uh, and an awful lot of Ashkenazim didn't do honey. Um, it's not so easy to get hold of everywhere. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, I was brought up with apple and uh, sugar and aniseed. Uh, that was our thing, which was a Sephardi thing. Um, but others do other sweet things. But did you know that there is a Rosh Hashanah Seder? There's a whole Seder to be said on the evening of Rosh Hashanah around your dining room table. There are eight or nine different food items to eat and uh, sentences to say on each one. Uh, approximately, 
uh, may it be your will, God, to look after us and uh, do something for us in some way. And usually there's some kind of Hebrew pun on the on the meaning of the thing it is you're about to eat. So if you're going to eat leeks or boiled spinach or um, the head of a sheep or whatever it might be, uh, there's a pun to be had on it. If your Hebrew is good enough to enjoy not very funny puns. Um, but there's a whole Rosh Hashanah Seder. Guys, if you're not going to do Shul, at least do Seder. Look it up. Rosh Hashanah Seder. There's a whole collection. It doesn't go on as long as Pesach Seder. Don't worry about that. It lasts, uh, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes maybe. Um, and you don't have to do all the bits because there's lots of them and you can pick the ones you like. Um, but a Rosh Hashanah Seder, it makes sure that Rosh Hashanah belongs at your table, not just in your shul. Um, look it up, check it out. That might be another thing that you don't know about. Um, the only thing really to have survived in popular custom is indeed this business of apple and honey um the business of taking something sweet uh and saying this line some of you will know it that uh, may it be your will so that's the formula which is said a similar formula which is said on each of the different foods of the rosh Hashanah seda if you want to make your festival meal uh, a little uh more extensive uh, check out the other items you can add uh, and do two three five six eight ten of them uh, to try them out uh, on that occasion um, so that's another uh, practice from Roshana which I hope has uh, been an introduction for some of you um, so let's come back to this idea of uh, the beginning of the year the new year or the Jewish New Year. Well, we say it's the Jewish New Year, but of course there are four New Years. Some of you will know that too. There are four Jewish New Years. You might think, what well, typical of the Jews? Why can't they just be like everybody else and make do with one? But of course, we've already established that even America doesn't have one New Year. Uh, first of all, you've got January the 1st, everybody knows that, uh, but you also have the beginning of the academic year. We've uh, discussed the schools and colleges start their year on some other date, not on January the 1st. And I don't know how it is in America, but in Britain, for example, we have a tax year. Um, it doesn't all start on the 1st of January. Our tax regime starts on the 6th of April for various historical reasons. Um, we uh, we have a different date for uh, starting the new registration numbers on cars, which is something to do with encouraging people to buy cars in months they normally wouldn't buy them and stuff like that. Um, so we've got uh, we've got a grass shooting season, the new year for grass shooting. You might have a horse racing season that only starts at the beginning of whenever it is, or a, a, an American football season that starts on a particular date or various things like that. Having lots of New Year's makes very good sense. We have them for different reasons according to when they suit. So we have several New Year's and you'll obviously you know Rosh Hashanah, but if you just stop and think about it, you will also no doubt know Tu Bishvat, the New Year for Trees. The New Year for Trees is uh, a tax year effectively. Um, according to the Torah, uh, you did not eat, you should not eat the fruit from a new, uh, a new tree. Um, you should leave it for a couple of years and then you can consume the fruit in the third year. But from the fourth year, you have to tithe the produce. So uh, when the temple stood, you had to take a, a proportion of your produce and make an offering of it. So you didn't have to do that with a new tree, uh, but you had to do it once it was old enough. So it's all very well saying that you've got to do that in the fourth year of a tree. But how old is a tree? Right? When, when you plant it, uh, uh, how, do you have to keep its kind of birthday card or something to get a birth certificate for each tree? I mean, how do you decide how old a tree is? So you have a new year for trees, like a tax year. You fix a date 
And then everything that happens during that year is one year, and then everything that happens during the next year is two years, and so on. You don't have to say, no, 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 this tree was planted on the 5th of February, and therefore it's one year old on the 6th of February next year, whereas this tree was planted on the 14th of March, and therefore it's not a year old until uh, the 15th of March next year. Right? You don't have to do that. Uh, you can simply say, new year for trees, 6th of February, every tree during this year is one year old, and on from there. New Year for Trees, it's about tax. Uh, we had a New Year for Kings as well, right? A king who reigned for um, less than a year, that is, who didn't reign over a Rosh Hashanah, right? Was judged not to have reigned at all. But if he reigned the, just before and died four days later, he was considered to have reigned for a year. I don't know the logic of that, but there it is. These new years make a difference. So when is the key Jewish new year? Well, actually, it's Pesach. It's Nisan. That's the beginning. That's the first month. That is the beginning of the year. No two ways about it. We're told in the Torah it's the first month. It's the only month with a name in the Torah. It's the month of Aviv. Every other month is just numbered, right? The sixth month, the seventh month, and so on. Those names that we have now, Tishri and Cheshvan and so on, are Babylonian. We learned them when we went to Babylon. Until then, they were just numbered months. So Pesach is Jewish New Year. Rosh Hashanah is the world's New Year. So what are the Jews? Are the Jews a particular group or are we flying the flag for the world? Well, on Rosh Hashanah, we're flying the flag for the world. How strange then that quite possibly this is the day on which Jews are most Jewish. When it's really the day on which Jews should be most universal. So there's a little tension and dilemma which we will pick up next week when we turn to Yom Kippur and I'm going to stop there um, we have a few more minutes I think and we can take some questions or comments let me just have a look uh, we've had a zoom chat um, uh, ah, right. Dominique Tomasov has said that if we had both celebrations in the same month there would have been too much cooking to do let me do a little thing about cooking here guys because I want to tell you this, there is nothing in the Torah or the Talmud that says that festivals should be utterly exhausting for homemakers. They should be enjoyable and pleasant and restful. And we have turned festival occasions into massive dinner party hysteria, where we have made it so difficult for us to greet guests because it's exhausting that we're tempted almost not to have guests or to complain or grumble because of the festival this is not the festival that did it it's we who do it to ourselves you know some of you will know and i don't quite know what the position is amongst conservative communities but i know that reform communities have one day of many festivals and orthodox communities have two Right. When did it become the case that two days of festival is not as good as one? When did it become the case when you've got two days of festival and even Orthodox Jews go, oh dear, you know, another day of such a strain, so much eating and cooking and washing up and blah, 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 blah. right? Why would anybody say, well, I've got two weeks holiday, but I'd much rather just have one because two weeks is so much lying about by the pool and sunbathing and reading and relaxing. I wish I only had one week's holiday, right? We don't do that. But on festivals, we made them such a strain for ourselves because we made it all about dinner party showing off rather than conviviality and being together with people we love and enjoy and relaxing and getting into it so folks if you don't do anything else you know covid has prevented an awful lot of our community life let's try and make it diminish too 
the excessive hysteria we've imposed on our festivals so that they are genuinely lovely social occasions without having to show off, without having to beat the last one, without having to do something. You know, I'm going to have people around for, for Rosh Hashanah evening, get in six pizzas and just sit and eat, you know, enjoy. None of those people are hungry. None of them came to you because they're starving. They came to you because they wanted to spend time with you. Not to admire your dishes or be amazed by your culinary skills. They just wanted to spend some time together with folk. Make it lovely. Make it easy. Make it enjoyable. Then it's a festival. Okay, so just looking down the list here. Um, right, yes. Well, Jeffrey Kaufman and, uh, Kaufman and Mary Craft, absolutely right. Uh, that God is out there and unknowable. Um, the king is a temporal authority and absolutely right do we bring the rules down to 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 earth um but a king is still quite a a distant character so this avinu malkenu our father our king is a still more assertive grabbing grabbing god by the lapels and pulling him in you know you come here right it's an amazing amazing liturgical act um so all oh, right, well, we've got, uh, good, we've got an Iraqi Jew here, that's good. So you know about the Seder, of course you do, that's good. Um, and Debbie Malign has asked, who composed the liturgy for Shofrot, Malchiot and Zichronot, those three sections? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, the general convention is, the tradition is that these main Amidas, the, the main parts of the service, were constructed by a group of people called the Anshe Knesset Hagadola, the um, sometimes translated the men of the great synagogue or the men of the great assembly. Uh, these are the folk that um, uh, predated the creation of the Sanhedrin. They're a little kind of post-Babylonian exile uh, and they start the process of ordering and not least structuring what goes on in synagogues. So we know that synagogues started to emerge in Babylonian times uh, when the temple was destroyed and the Jews were exiled. And when the Jews came back to Jerusalem and they reconstructed the temple, started to reconstruct the temple, they didn't discard this nascent, this prototype uh, thing they created and they continued with it. And it continued to develop in its structure. Um, and we think that the Unshaken Knesset Hagadullah, the, the uh, men of the Great Assembly, um, started to formalize the liturgy of, of that, uh, of the synagogue, what goes on in the synagogue. And the main part of it was the Amida. Um, and mostly we blame them for the daily Amida, but I imagine that they probably started to construct the shape of the Rosh Hashanah Amida as well. Um, it's certainly it's it's got that shape by by the Mishnah anyway, but that's another 500 years sometime in between that. Um, oh, Yana Bridal, how do you celebrate alone? Uh, Yana, can I say that, that it's difficult when you're by yourself, except you absolutely must remember that you're not alone right? You may be on your own in that space, uh, but Jews all over the world are celebrating with you. And one of the ways I think in which you celebrate alone is to enjoy the freedom of being your own person, of making your own time and choosing your own time, of doing things and, um, what shall I say, savouring the moments because sometimes when we're by ourselves we feel that you know there are longers you know, the, the day is long how do you fill it but you know also everything is rich and when you're not by yourself it swings past you don't even have time to appreciate it so if you can somehow slow things down rather than speed them up slow them down and savor them and remember that you are not alone you may just be the only person in that space you're in that there are many many jews and indeed this year of course so many more jews 
in their own space on their own. So all of us, all of us should make sure that we feel that collectivity that we're part of. But I think that is a challenge. But we can celebrate alone. Um, sing. I, I don't know if uh, you all have good singing voices, but one of the glories of being on your own is you can sing at the top of your voice and nobody will look askance. So sing. Enjoy singing. And, and if you don't know the tune, it doesn't matter if you're on your own. You can sing whatever you like. So don't feel inhibited by yourself. That's the last time in feeling inhibited. Feel liberated and love it. So that's what I would suggest. Um, and of course, if you, I mean, obviously, if you're shielding or sheltering because of COVID, then it's difficult for you to get out. But if that's not the case for you, there will be someone else, if you want, that you can invite around. There will be other people who would love to have. It doesn't have to be a great day and an evening and a long night and stuff. Who would love to just come and join you for one of those pizzas I told you to get in. Right? And then you can both sing out of tune together and have a good laugh because you're sharing. So obviously it's difficult if you need to be by yourself. Um, but if you don't need to be, then don't be. Invite someone. Right? Don't wait to be invited. Invite someone. Be the centre of your community, not on the periphery. Um, so, ah, Harriet says, I love your permission to relax and enjoy, but doesn't family tradition enter in here? Yes, it does. Create a family tradition about relaxing and enjoying. Right, guys, where do you think family traditions came from? They came from the family. You're a member of the family. Create the tradition. I don't mean that if your family has always had a 12 course meal, that you are now just going to give them all a sandwich. But you don't have to have a 12 course meal. Cut it down to five. You know, I mean, lighten up a bit. You'll probably find that three quarters of the family anyway is hugely grateful because they couldn't bear the 12. They all went home and complained about it to each other. So family traditions can be developed. They don't have to be disrupted, but they can be developed. And people, that's why they belong to people, because people make them theirs. So I'm sure you can find a way to do that. Um, and ah, Jeff and Debbie Podles, Podlas ask, if Rosh Hashanah is supposed to be the birth of the world, why do we only eat Breshit, uh, read Breshit at Simchat Torah? Excellent question, and if only I had time to answer it. But what I will point out is this, just as a last thing for you all to think of. It's supposed to be the birthday of the world, Jeff and Debbie, and therefore we would expect to read Breshit. But we don't. So what do we read? This day of remembrance, this day of blowing the shofar. What would you expect that we might read? The day on which we are face to face with God. Maybe we read something grand, the Ten Commandments. Maybe we read about the Exodus from Egypt. Maybe we read some towering moment. And instead, what do we do? We plunge right into the most intimate details of the domestic reality of our patriarch's history. At the moment at which we talk about the birthday of the world, we read about the birthday of a child. That is the Jewish chutzpah. If you want to make something big, we say to God, we're going to make it domestic. This is ours and it belongs here next to me, on my table, in my mouth, in my heart. It's here and I own it. If you can remember that, then it'll be a real Yom Hazikaron. I'm done. Thank you. So that was just part one. You, you sure you have more to share with us next week, or are we done? Oh yeah, we go on to Yom Kippur next time. Okay. Okay, everybody. Well, lots to think about, and thank you. And thank you for... Um, taking the service apart and rebuilding it in a different way than most of us have heard. I hope there were three things there for everybody. If Carl, uh, anybody things, didn't get three things, um, it, it would be nice to know. Uh, tell Ari, don't tell me. Um, <laughs> and take money from his bank account. He's the guy that made the promise, really, because he's in charge. I didn't. I just took your email you sent me and forwarded <laughs> to my people. 
<laughs> okay, everybody. Well, Clyde, thank you. That was very um, interesting, thoughtful. And uh, pizza for Rosh Hashanah, unless you're lactose intolerant. I would not recommend that unless you can get the alternative cheese. But um, yeah, what a great program. I hope you all have a lot to think about today. It is Monday. It feels like Sunday. It's Monday. The heat is broken a bit. I, I checked the temperatures. You can go outside now. And go look around. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I, hope this, I hope this and some of our other programs and the programs coming up prepare you for the holidays. You know, it's hard to prepare for holidays in general. Most of us just show up at synagogue and notice that they've repainted or built a whole new building or something, or a new rabbi. Um, but this year, you can't even do that. <laughs> so um, the goal of these programs is to give you something to think about here. If you've participated in our programs with Rafi Zaram from the UK, remember that on September 13th, which is uh, this coming Sunday, there's a whole day of learning coming out of England. And you can sign up. And even if you don't, you can't attend live if you sign up. Um, and register for the program, there's a charge. They will send you a link and you can watch a lot of the programs that they've put up. And I know that Hadar has stuff they're sharing and I'm sure your synagogues are sharing lots of stuff. So, uh, gosh, I, I've been on the earth, uh, you know, half a century or so. Some, many of you have been on longer than I have. In many ways, it's gonna be one of the harder Rosh Hashanahs. I can't be with my family in Boston, which we've done every year. I can't be with my parents and, and we can't travel to Boston, which is a great place to go in the fall. Um, but it's also one of the most creative um, Rosh Hashanahs ever, given the incredible amount of materials you can find right now, not just CSP stuff, but incredible stuff. And remember, your services, your synagogues, if you belong to one, will have it, but go visit other synagogues if, that, if, you're, if you're willing to um, travel that way on Shabbos, on Yom Tov. I mean, um, go see what's going on. I do understand that some synagogues in LA have hired like Lionsgate Film Production Company to produce their services. In New York, they've hired film uh, TV production studios. So if you can get in to uh, those services, check them out. I'll spend time with your community as well. But take this one year and this one opportunity to see what's going on in the Jewish world. Uh, all around the world, there'll be resources. So with that, I uh, wish you a happy uh, Elul day and happy uh, Shana Tova coming up. But I hope that I'll see you all, if not tomorrow, at least, uh, or, or this week, I'll see you next week when Clive returns. Right, Clive, you're coming back? Indeed I am. You promise? Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you, Mimi. Bye-bye, um, everybody. Good night from here. It's half past nine. Good night. Good night, London. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye, Yana. Bye, Cornells. Bye, Rena. Bye, Faith Herschler. I can see Wendy Lupel, Harold Walt. Faith, I can see you. Ted Cooper. If you got an email from me, you should open it. Press the button. See what's there. Okay, bye guys. Take care. Bye, Rosella. <laughs>